Good afternoon. Today is 28 May, the year 2010. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today, I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteer Greg Kenny and special guest Marjorie Harlow. Not Jean, is your middle name Jean? No. No, okay. <laughs> you look kind of like her, the same color hair and everything. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing machine, uh, air, aviation machinist mate, first class, Hap Harlow. Machinist mate Harlow was an aircraft mechanic aboard the carrier Bunker Hill, CV-17, in the Pacific during World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Hap, so glad to have you here. I'm here. Okay, now let me get you kind of lined up here. Okay. Let's see what. Well, I'm going to move you over here just a little bit. I think you can just a, a tad, a little bit more. Okay, there you go. That blue field clashes with your hat, so we've got to, got to get it just right, right? <laughs> or Marjorie would, very be, good. Marjorie would be very upset about oh, that. Oh, yeah, I'll get real well, <laughs> Now, um, Hap, first of all, would you uh, please repeat and spell your full name for us? Well, my regular name is uh, Harry S. Harlow. Okay. I was born March 1st, 1924 in Santa Ana, California. 1924, so that makes you how many years young? 86 now. I look like you're going strong. Santa Ana, huh? Uh, that was a little bit different then than it is now, I would assume. Well, that was a big town of 25,000 people. <laughs> um, and as we know, Santa Ana is kind of south, south of or, LA, Los Angeles, yeah. down in the Orange County. And your dad, what was his name? Well, I'm a junior. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, they never called you junior, though, or? Oh, I had been. I finally outgrew it, though. <laughs> okay. Got to be taller than my dad. <laughs> and uh, what did your dad do? He was in the auto parts business. Uh, it was a company called Hockaday Harlow and Phillips that had parts stores all the way from Whittier to Oceanside, which is pretty good size operation in the 19, late 20s and the early 30s. But my dad uh, had a collapsed lung in 1932 and had to sell his interest and uh, due to health problems, collapsed lung and everything, he was required to, or suggested that he move to a higher altitude. So uh, went from Santa Ana to Lake Arrowhead. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the extinction or distinction or whatever you want to call it, going to three different high schools in three years. Oh. Santa Ana for sophomore, San Bernardino for junior, and uh, San, uh, Palm Springs for a uh, senior year. I oh. graduated in 1941. From Palm Springs High? Yeah, wow. There's 28 kids in the class. <laughs> of course, I understand they're cranking them out by the hundreds now. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> but uh, Thousands, there maybe. again, it was a kinder and gentler time. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, and your, um, uh, how did your dad end up in California in the first place? Where did all the ancestors come from? World War One. They were from Maine, and uh, he was a, in the motor pool in the Army in World War One, oh. and he got out and started the first Model T Ford garage in Fort Fairfield, Maine in 1919. But, uh, he didn't care for that, and they wanted something different, so they had an opportunity with uh, several of his cousins. They all came to California. Some of them settled in Riverside, and uh, well, he settled in uh, Huntington Beach, then moved to Santa Ana, and started this parts operation that I had mentioned in 1925. Was it like a, 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 a parts store, like you go down to the, just, a, parts just, job, just, yeah. you just walk in, kind of like you do now? Yeah. And yeah, get your parts. Want a water pump for a Chevy? That's what you can ask for. Yeah. 
Uh, so when he was in World War One, did he go overseas? No, he was just ready at Newport News when the armistice came. So. Uh, and your mother, what was her name and her maiden name? Verna Shaw Harlow. Okay, her, her maiden name was Shaw. Then. Shaw, uh, yes. And did they meet in Maine? Yes. Uh, she, it's a long time, only girl he ever yeah. took a shine to. And what did her father do? I don't know. That's the unknown part of my ancestry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, and you were, so when you were born, uh, you were born in Santa Ana. Yes, sir. And you're, you're, you were living where, or where, were they living right in Santa Ana? Yeah, but North Ross Street. Oh, okay. Remember the address? 1920. And how many years did you live there? Oh, from, uh, let's see, I moved there in 31, and we moved out of there in 1938. Okay. That's when they went to the mountains. But you were born in 24? 24, 24, 1924. And you lived, did you live in that house then? Yeah. That yeah, same one, okay. Um, and did you have any brothers and sisters? I have two, or had two younger sisters. They're both deceased by now. But, uh, and what were their names? Uh, Elaine was two and a half years younger than I was. And my other sister, Janet, was 10 years younger. In fact, she was born on St. Patrick's Day of 1934, so she automatically got the middle name of Patricia. Oh, yeah. Was your family very religious? Did you go to church a lot when you were a kid? Yes. Got stuck every Sunday in there. <laughs> Where did you go? First Baptist Church in Santa Ana. Okay. Um, and now you grew up during the Depression. What was that like for you and your family? Uh, actually, compared to many of them, it was comparatively easy. Was your dad able to work the whole time? He was, yeah. Okay, but he got sick later yeah, on. Yeah, he said 32, his lung collapsed. Then he had another one in 36. That's when he had to sell out his interest. I so see. he was, in fact, they opened a big new parts store in Santa Ana in 1931, which was a new heard of. But uh, they managed it, and he ran a, a good, close knit organization. Yeah. Unfortunately, that was, quite the organizational <laughs> partners that he had. Did you ever work in the store? No, I never was old enough. I was big enough to get in their shipping department, <laughs> crawl through all their cardboard cartons and make a mess out of them, but <laughs> other than that. Did you have any odd jobs as a kid? Well, uh, they all came when we moved to the desert in 19, the uh, later part right. of 1939 and 40. Oh. Okay. And the early part of 41, yeah. I uh, worked at a service station there to, for a fellow, a shell station. It was right close to my folks' place. And I worked for the Safeway store. Yeah. It was down Palm Canyon Drive. And I worked for uh, poor Plaza Garage as the gopher, so to speak. I deliver cars to the people. That Is that the same Plaza Motors that they have now? That's the one that evolved the, the into, into Plaza Motors, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think they, yeah, the we know the Jessups very well, and yeah. I think they've been with them for a long, long time. Well, going back to um, in that Shell Station, where was that? It's Cornerville, Alameda, and Palm Canyon Drive. Okay, it's not the one that that. Well, that would have been a later one anyway. Yeah, that was yeah. out there that day. Um, but well, going back to when you were a kid in Santa Ana, did you go to the beach a lot? Every time I could cut school, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which beach did you go to? Oh, Corona Del Mar, usually. Oh, yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah. 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 And did you do any surfing? No, I just got wet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, other than that, what did you kids do for fun when you were growing up? Well, uh, my oldest younger sister, her main purpose in life, I think, was to be devil me. Especially when I got up to dating age to go to school dances. I always got to use the family car if I took her along, too. That was not exactly my idea of fun, but that's all history. What was the first uh, family car that you remember that you had? I had a 39 Plymouth station wagon mm -hmm. that they used for the 
motels or motor courts then. But uh, and the, my first car was a 37 Plymouth Coupe. I got when I was just, I guess, wasn't the president or anything. I earned it or stuff I'd worked for with my folks because I helped them around the motel too. But, okay, uh, me, okay, so your folks had a motel? Well, equivalent to it, yeah. Yeah, where? In it was Springs? on El Alameda Street, oh, Palm Springs. What was the name of it? Harlow Haven. <laughs> is that motel still there? Yes. Yes, but it's under a different name and uh, different management and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, how long did they have that hotel? Up until when? Uh, they sold it in, uh, I think, about '48. I was still in the Navy. Oh, you were. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my my wife's. Uh, uh, she grew. She came here in 1956, and they bought a little hotel on Alejo, I think, in yeah. uh, um, Palm Canyon there. Yeah. And uh, so she she grew up in a hotel, too, had one right. of the rooms, was her was her room. I guess yeah. that's kind of like what you did, too. Well, we, we were just telling them out there that uh, didn't have air conditioning in those days. One of my summertime jobs was to fill up 11 uh, number three wash tubs with water every day, make sure they all didn't evaporate <laughs> off. Yeah, the swamp coolers too, I guess. Yeah. Um, going back to when you were in Santa Ana, do you remember uh, what was the first grammar school you went to? Jefferson. Went clear through that to the sixth grade. Yeah. Then clear through Willard Junior High School there. And uh, went one year in Santa Ana. High school. And that's when I, my nomadic career started. <laughs> Did you uh, play any sports in school? Uh, no, I was a. High school football manager. Oh, you were. His sophomore year, I didn't have time to get into any sports in San Bernardino because I didn't know enough people to. Now, when you but you were living up at Arrowhead, and you went to high school in in San Bernardino. Is yes, we boarded there. We were in the world. Oh, you did. Hadn't even been built yet, so we boarded during the week. Oh. Uh -huh. Brought a block away from the original McDonald's, <laughs> which is a good habitat. Now when when was that McDonald's? When was what year that was that? It would be nineteen thirty nine, thirty eight, So it was there when you were Yeah. Oh, yeah okay. it just had started at McDonald's. And was it a big deal then? Uh, no, no, just a, just a little something there. Kinda like what your earlier drive is look like, yeah. typical. Yeah well, I saw on uh, T V you know, a couple months ago they had it was quite a long, very involved about the history of the McDonald's and oh, yeah. how it started and how it ended up. Today. You know, uh, Croc, I guess, or somebody bought it. You yeah, know, he was a salesman. Yeah, for somebody else yeah. bought the whole thing. And then it was their idea, I think, to do yeah. the yeah the, the real fast food program, kind yeah. of stuff. I think the original was just kind of a normal. Well, the attitude before for the war wasn't quite as expansive as what. We discovered after the war. So you moved to Palm Springs in what year did you say? Later thirty nine. And what what year did you graduate from? Oh, so you forty one. Forty one. You graduated. Yeah, Twenty eight uh, kids in the class. Yeah. Do you remember some of those kids that you were? Yeah, well, one of the boys, uh, Ham Hamilton, and I joined the Navy together oh, yeah. as soon as I became eighteen. Okay. Uh, split split between fourteen boys. And Fourteen girls for some reason, yeah. and I know they never faced with anything. Do you remember like some of the other names of the kids? Uh, oh, you know? see, there's Don Pendry and Dick Outcall, Ray Sorum, and uh, the Hall brothers, Allen and the Darcy, I even forget Bill. But uh, that's about all of them that I remember because. Uh, None of them ever uh, came back to uh, Palm Springs. Springs. They all went to the big city, I guess. Now, uh, had you been coming to Palm Springs at all much before you moved down here? No. So how did you how, how did you adjust to the summers in the desert? Uh, they were quite a deal, but uh, well, they say, oh, you just take salt pills and right. keep on going. Now, was there a pool at your hotel? No. Okay. It was pre pre-war. <laughs> and where, so if you wanted to go to the pool, where did you usually go? Uh, I don't 
don't think I ever went to a to tell you the truth. <laughs> And you were you working? You said you were working at the Shell station for a while and at the Safeway. Yeah. Okay. And at the Plaza Motors. And Pla oh, you, okay. I joined the Navy when I was working there. What were you doing there at Plaza? I was the gopher. I'd take around the cars to the people that uh, wanted them to deliver, like Ben Crosby's wife and stuff like that, because uh, it was a bunch of parking garages. It was a service facility at the time. That's how come we. We're also the Greyhound bus station, which I get to come down at 10 yeah, o'clock sure. every night and make sure the bus through Phoenix came through there. That was it. And were they selling Chevrolets then? No, they had not uh, got up to the car dealership. Oh, they were just like a... Just a parking garage. Oh. Ed McCubre was the owner. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I think that he's name. a uh -huh. father-in-law to somebody down there. Yeah, probably. I had never followed through or not getting reacquainted with them. Yeah. Um, did you see many movie stars around town? Oh, you remember? Yeah, a few, but uh, didn't make much of an impression on me. Uh, yeah. Not a big <laughs> career lover or whatever you yeah. want to call them. So do you remember what you were doing December 7th, 1941? Yes, yeah, so I was right at my folks' uh, hotel on that Sunday morning. I looked out the back window, right next door to the Palm Springs Florist, which is still there which at the time were owned by some Japanese people, and they didn't bother opening their doors that day. Mm -hmm. In fact, they uh, stayed behind the curtain pretty well yeah. till the new war off, so to speak. Yeah. We just, I just interviewed a fellow a couple months ago, and he's Japanese-American and mm -hmm. uh, grew up in Riverside, but then they moved down here and it was down around India. In fact, his, they had, his dad had a, a small a farm yeah. Of where the date uh, uh, Shields date place oh, is, yeah. yeah, and uh, it was, and of course they had to go to the, you know, those camps over in Arizona, right? And, uh, yeah. yeah, so it was, uh, yeah. Um, so, ha were you up on current events? Could you see something like that coming uh, Pearl Harbor? At the uh, time? Pretty well figured out, but uh, I was only seventeen at the time, yeah. and. Uh, Kind of waited till my 18th birthday, and that was when I started getting serious about joining the service. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that time, it was strictly the Navy, I didn't want to be a ground pounder of any sort. And where did you go for a boot camp? I went to San Diego, California. I got a crazy duty, you know. I always tell you, volunteer for truck driver. That means pushing a wheelbarrow around. <laughs> did mess cook in every galley at the station. And the most important thing I ever did in the galley was uh, flip a hamburger over on the floor. And I had to pick it up and carry it around to the cook and ask him, what do I do it? And he said, throw it back on the stove. What that do you think for this? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Ham and I was on the garbage detail. Oh, so you guys are both went in together yeah, we and you got through the in, sink? In, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, he broke boots first because he applied for air conditioning school, which uh, after his six-year hitch was up in 48, he got out and started Ham's air conditioning service in Indio oh, and uh, yeah. became very successful after yeah. that. Uh -huh. But uh, well, I signed up for six years and uh, re-enlisted again in 48 for two. Okay. Gave me 10 years. Of course, the shipping overpay was Sixteen hundred dollars back in that day, and that was big money, I thought. <laughs> but uh, so when you were down in San Diego, um, um, had you been to San Diego any much before, or had you been down there? Did you well, know much I about the town? Went to the zoo one time, I think, yeah. stuff like that. Right. And that's when they had the ferry boats going over to yeah. uh, North Nichols, Island. And nickel Stancher, they called it. <laughs> nickel Stancher. Yeah. Um, so, and then where did you go from there? I would finish boots and uh, went to aviation machinist mate school in Seattle, Washington Naval Air Station. Did you apply to that, or did they knew, I knew asked that if you I could become an aviation machinist mate? And because you had worked uh, with uh, uh, machines yeah. and things like that, right? Yeah, and uh, I made it, and uh, we graduated in December of '42. In time to. Uh, 
the Illinois that graduated as third class petty officer aviation, excuse me. Then they sent us to Norfolk to the aviation base advanced training unit for about two weeks, then uh, assigned us to Air Group 17, which went on the bunker, or was assigned to the bunker hill in air, as part of Air Group 17. Mm -hmm. And I got situated down in the group that uh, they sent 40 of us. 40 went, 10 went to the torpedo squadron, 10 to the bomber squadron, 10 to the scout squadron, and 10 of us went to the uh, fighter squadron. And uh, that's where I got introduced to the Corsair, because we didn't even have any when the squadron was formed in January of 43. Yeah. What did they have? Uh, Wildcats then? A couple of SNJ trainers. They had one Wildcat that they had. But then in the, oh, March or April, sometime along, we started getting some Corsairs. Tommy Blackburn, the skipper, went up with the first bunch. And, Flew one bag. Was that the Jolly Rogers? Yes, sir. That's right. Yeah, I thought that so. was. That was the most uh, eventful outfit I was ever in, other than the fighter engineering division of uh, the Bunker Hill. Mm -hmm. But it just it exceedingly well grouped as a kind of a carefree outfit. Like, uh, some of our pilots got put on report for flat hat in the Naval Air Station in Norfolk and a few things. So they were there tra doing training exercises. The, was the Bunker Hill there then? No, it was still under construction. Oh, I see. But did you know you were going to go on the yes, Bunker Yes, because oh. uh, it was launched on December 7th of 40, 41. Yeah, it was still building all of 42. Okay. And then. Uh, Oh, well, about June or July, it was came down to Norfolk, picked up the air group, went down to the Caribbean to take down crews. We were the first carrier in the fleet to qualify Corsairs for carrier duty. Now, uh, as I understand it, the Corsair initially was kind of difficult to handle, especially it, on uh, landing because of the stall yeah. and the torque. Well, I was plane captain at the time, and on the shakedown cruise, if a certain lieutenant that they had on a roster was to fly that day, I automatically got two main wheels, and at that time they used inflatable tire tail wheels, because I could count on him to come in and bounce on a deck and blow all three tires. But needless to say, he wasn't uh, in the squadron when they went to sea regular. He, <laughs> Michael himself a transfer by hook or crook. <laughs> yeah. and which, is, as I understand it, is one reason the Marines ended up with them because they could fly them off of the yeah, um, islands and then you know, you didn't have to be as exact yeah, when you were coming they did in. With our fighter squadron when they got to Pearl Harbor, they made them land base, but that's another story. Okay, well, we'll get to but, that. But uh, it was a very nice outfit and I learned more. VF-17 and uh, on the uh, fighter maintenance business on the Bunker Hill and I did the rest of my naval career. When you said you were a plane captain, that means that you're responsible for one plane. Right. right? And your responsibilities are? Everything to keep the windshields clean to make sure that it didn't leak any oil. Because the Corsair had a bugaboo, I guess, that it, uh, it catch oil and bottom cylinder, same one that had to have something with it. So always had to make sure you pulled the prop through so you didn't have any hydraulic lock, which they were capable of having with the R2800 engine. By the way, Greg, and you too, Marjorie, if you have uh, if you have a question or something, just, just feel free to jump in there, Greg. Um, so how long did you have, did, so, well, you were down on your shakedown cruise. Was there any problems with the ship itself on that shape, shakedown cruise? No, but it had to go back to Boston Navy Yard and get finishing touches put on it. So the air group was dropped off at Norfolk and uh, we did more training there. Mm -hmm. But uh, and they, uh, 
August of 43, after the shakedown and went back, we uh, headed for the Pacific by way of the Panama Canal. What was that like going through the canal? Well, it was pretty tricky. It was uh, six inch clearance, I think, for a, for an Essex class carrier. They had to un weld about two gun tubs of 40 millimeter guns so they could clear the locks of the canal. But at the time they had three section Liberty, so I was on Liberty the night before we got the Atlantic side, so they put me on standby duty there. And on the Pacific side, I was on a duty section. And then I had Liberty the first night we went to sea. But I made up for it because I got a 36 hour pass when I hit San Diego. And I hitchhiked home to give my mother a coronary when I woke her up at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> but uh, then they used their whole month's gas ration to haul me back to San Diego the next night. But uh, the transformation of the ship in that one day between had all our air group plus some replacement aircraft and a marine detachment, a CB battalion. So I slept in my plane the whole time between San Diego and Pearl Harbor. Did you have any uh, veterans aboard that had, say, been at Midway or, or a Coral Sea, or, any, or all you guys are just pretty fresh? Uh, we had two pilots that had seen duty with the SORFs, but uh, mm -hmm. and none of the mechanics, the biggest one we had served aboard the Ranger in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. and, and so you had, you still had Corsairs? At, yes, we had there. And, and uh, dive bombers, what kind, what did you have? Had, we were also the first carrier to carry the SB-2C oh, okay. hell divers. This, was it as good as the SBD or what? No. Is, I didn't think so. They used to always call it the beast. <laughs> the poor mechanics on that thing worked yeah. forever. You always wonder why why did they change? The SBD was seemed such a great plane. Oh, it was a good old plane. It just yeah. they thought it was obsolete because it wasn't quite as fast, but it did a better job, I thought. But yeah. and I you're, never worked on any of them either. Yeah. Well they're the ones that you know, that hit the Japanese carrier, or yeah. sunk those at the middle. Yeah. And the um, the um, torpedo bombers, what, what did you have? I had TBFs. Avengers, yeah. yeah. Okay. And did you have um, any, any other planes besides that? Those three? Oh, no, you had a 36 plane fighter squadron. Oh, you have 17. Well, that's your, your, the your course. The 36. Right. And the torpedo squadron is only 18. Yeah. Oh, that, that made that's the way that. For six class carriers, the way they had them categorized. Do you remember? Okay, now you're the guy that w was having trouble down when your shakedown cruise. Is he long gone from your? So, but you had a pl another. You had a plane. Yeah, I had the planes. And who, who, who did you have? One plane. One plane. And who? One you, pilot. And do you remember the pilot you had then? Oh yeah, his name's Earl May. Did he survive the war? Yes, he did. He was an ace, and uh, I ran across him when. After the war, when I, of course, from there I went to Bunker Hill, I went to Whidbey Island, to Adak, Alaska, then to Corpus Christi, Texas in 49 or 48, and uh, checked in there. And uh, I had made first class petty officer in the meantime. So Friday night at 8 o'clock, I became the officer of the day because I was the junior one at the time. And I hadn't been on duty more than hour and a half and these two scroungy guys come in wanting to know if they could get the key to the walk-in refrigerator because they had a hang up of deer they wanted. And I looked at him and he looked at me and we both recognized each other at the same time. I said, is that you Earl? And he said, yeah, is that you Hap? <laughs> and uh, just went from there. So he made the hunting and fishing guide out of me because he was a recreation <laughs> officer at the base. I'm assuming that um, that he flew some combat missions when you were, and we'll, we'll get into that, but I'm just asking. I got some flight time in the back seat of SV-2C one time Did you know? at Bajuro in the Marshalls. Oh, yeah. I started in for his dive to go down and I tripped a seat release <laughs> by accident. <laughs> so I got to look out over the bird cage there at 11,000 feet and watch us. Head towards Earth, which 
and he'd be out there. I don't ever get caught like this again. <laughs> but um, what was the feeling if if you knew that your pilot was going out and and might not come back again? I had that happen to me. I was the first plane captain after those Corsairs were gone, and uh, VF-18 took VF-17's place. And I happened to be the plane captain on the first casualty at 11th of November at Rabaul that lost a plane. And I was regular Navy then, so I got transferred down to the maintenance department, or the aircraft maintenance oh. B-2E. So your pilot was killed, do you think, or didn't come back? Or what? Well, he was missing in action. I don't ever know what happened to him. Do you remember his name? No. And what kind of plane? What, what, what I was on the S6F then. Oh, yeah, the Hellcat yeah. Okay. Oh, of course, air pilots got to oh, kiss us goodbye at Pearl Harbor. Oh, okay. So, of course, there's, all right. So, um, what was, uh, well, you had been down in the Caribbean. Uh, did you uh, ever get seasick, or how did you take to the water? I never got seasick the whole time I was on it. I didn't get seasick till I was on a tube transport going from Seattle to Adak, Alaska. <laughs> but that's another story. Okay. I don't know if we want to hear that one. Uh, <laughs> not very eventful. Uh, okay, so you get to Pearl. Um, was there any, could, was there still devastation from the Pearl Harbor attack that you could oh, see? We saw a lot of the wreckage, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I was in uh, the fall of 43. September, October, somewhere along there. Because mm -hmm. our first day of combat was Armistice Day, 11th of November of 43. Yeah. But uh, now we had uh, two weeks to learn S success after getting dethroned from our Corsair position. So we went over to Connie White Bay to the air station there, trained for two weeks. They both, those planes, have brought the same engine, yeah. they? Brought about the same size, except yeah. that the Corsair has those gull wings and the well, uh, Hellcat has a straight The main wings. difference in between the power plants was that the Corsair was an updraft carburetor when the Hellcat was down, downdraft. And, uh, uh, so what, what's the difference about that, or what, well, what, why uh, have uh, one, one, not another? Or the gas primer. If you over-primed it, you could set one on fire through a leakage and it does kicks off and one spark down on a gasoline puddle and big, yeah. big trouble. Yeah. But uh, Tommy Blackburn always had everybody pull the prop through, make sure there's no hydraulic lock and, and be very careful in starting Corsair because they had cartridge starters and if you didn't get it on three tries you had to start all over again. I was fortunate I had a knack. It never took me over two cartridges to get the thing lit off. And I had some of the other plane captains had me come over there and crank theirs up. So which which of the two planes did you prefer to work uh, on or have? Of course, Air Lover myself. <laughs> S6F nice. Well, that's good. Coming Ironworks put out a good aircraft, but. Uh, by comparison, uh, of course, of course, their speed was the main thing, but uh, I think it weighed two tons more, if I remember. I think the Hellcat weighed seven tons, and the Corsair loader weighed nine tons. Mm -hmm. So uh, they uh, had to get extreme efficiency out of their power plants. Yeah. So. Uh, and the. Uh had a shorter stretch, the Corsair did, than the Hellcat oh, yeah, was the reason for the gull wings. So, oh, yeah. to, uh, understand. so, um, so you're in Pearl, and you get your, uh, you still got your uh, SB2Cs and your, yeah, and your and of course, the gangs, just, <laughs> problems with heading up or yeah. just learning a new plane. And so, everything. so uh, now did you become part of a task force? Oh yeah. Which one was that? Yeah, we were. With the 58.3, I think. Uh, Essex, Purcells, and the Independence of the Princeton. There was two Essex classes, one of the CVLs. Yeah. And the 
and that's when we hit for a ball, and the VF-17 sent a detachment out, both one to the Essex with Roger Hitter, the exec group, and then Tommy Blackburn lit on Bunker Hill with those six planes, flying air cover for the fleet while the fleet planes were over taking care of the ball. Okay, so you had uh, VF-18 out and the 17 came in and right. they kind of flew air cover over you guys while well, they... There's a slight uh, <laughs> preference there. We, well, there's always a humorous outlook for VF-17 because Tommy Blackburn wanted to come in and take a hot shower and get a hot meal. <laughs> he was tired of living out of K rations. Have you read that book? I think it's a Jolly Ride, something like that. Yeah. Uh, about well, he just sent me an autographed copy. Did you really? Oh, yeah. that, that's really special to have. Yeah. I got it when it first came off the press. Yeah. We have it here with the. We didn't. Ha actually uh, donated it. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Um, uh, so. And who, that that was at Halsey's uh, task force, was it? Who do you know? Oh, we had to, Montgomery was our admiral on the first one. And uh, later on, we had so many different deals. Yeah. But uh, we, the only Essex carriers we worked with was either the Essex itself or the New York town or the New Lexington. So how, before you lost your plane, how many uh, sorties did he make? Or, uh, well, he lost him on the first combat mission. The first combat mission, oh, yes. We went through the, all the training from uh, Kaneohe Bay, and they had flight exercises out to Esperito Santos. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he just had the misfortune of getting caught. Was that on the Rabal raid? Yeah. Uh, and tell us a little bit about Rabal. Well, from what the pilot said is, quite a messy thing, but they were sure well fortified and uh, the harbor was well protected. Yeah, as I recall, Rabal was one of their bigger bases and actually we yeah. uh, we never did uh, invade it. We just kind of went around and it. Bypassed it. Bypassed yeah. it, but... Uh, Rabal and Truck were the two the truck. bugaboos as far as bases are concerned. Did you have any uh, missions to Rabal, uh, to Truck? Well, you had a couple of them. So you lost your plane, so then you say you went, you, you weren't a plane captain any longer? No, I went down to the engineering di division. Okay, and so what, what, what happens down there? What do you well, do? Become grease monkeys in, put all the 30 hour checks for, for routine maintenance. And on the, the planes or on, on the, the ship? Pla on the planes itself. On the planes themselves, yeah. yeah. Okay. But uh, we change engines, which is nice when you're flattening there. Out on the Pacific, trying to hold something still. <laughs> and the planes that come back shot up sometimes. Oh, some come up pretty bad. Did you work on on fixing up that part of them too? No, uh, oh, that uh, left that to the metalsmith's job. There, this later became the structural mechanics, as they call it. Uh -huh. uh, we were basically, hydraulic and uh, uh, engine parts, and controls, and stuff. Did you have a lot of spare parts to work with? Well, they had certain uh, ones. Then, uh, of course, uh, as you get to get experience with things, you know which parts you kind of get a few extra ones on hand so you didn't have to go to the storeroom and stand in line and yeah. wait and stuff like that. But uh, I got the culmination of that operation in Korea because I was the guy that came to, to get everything from deck shoes to spark plugs. <laughs> so we're you're in your task force. Um, would there be like one carrier and then you'd have some other ships around you or how, how, how did that work? Uh, they always had three carriers, usually two Essex class and one of the independence classes, mm -hmm. the CPLs. And destroyers around you? Oh yeah, we had a lot of them. And, yeah. Now, did you uh, undergo uh, any uh, enemy attacks? Oh yeah. Tell me about yeah, some of those. Started right at Rabaul, and uh, I guess the worst ones came when it was off of Tarawa for some reason or other. I know I was on a belly tank hanging detail in the one that uh, the 
they always worked in groups with three, one for the front end of the tank, one for the back end, and then they usually a chief along to give you the word all the time. But uh, we got uh, some Bettys going after our port side. Twin engine, this, twin engine bombers. Yeah. We, uh, on this Billy's Hank detail, and ours was the last plane to come in. So it was right there by the deck edge elevator because they. So you were going to switch tanks? Is that what you're. Put, I'll put on the one that they, replace the one they dropped. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we got the thing on there and they made the plane come down to the lower deck, the hangar deck. So when the elevator got back up, we climbed on that and went down down to the hangar deck. Meantime, General Quarters sounded. They shut all our roller curtains, stuck us out, three of us on this deck edge elevator on the Essex class carrier down. And then they started zigzagging. We took water over the front end of the elevator. We were trying to wrestle this tank at the same time. So we had a very good time. Big C story. <laughs> Did your ship take any hits? Oh uh, yeah, we came back from battle damage. That uh, that was a year later, though. The we'll first get, time. Well, we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, the Rabal and some of those earlier ones, we didn't uh, get hardly any damage, but uh, we got a lot of near misses. Mm -hmm. No common cause until after I got off. So. Okay. We, we had some close ones though, but uh, yeah. the farther the war progressed, the more active it became, so to speak. And were you below decks most of the time when, yeah, when, when they were? Yeah, the deck, when they except were, when we were on a belly tank detail and yeah. a hangar on the flight. Well, that, that's, I mean, what are your thoughts when you're down there that if we get hit hard or bad, you know, am I going to be able to get off this plane, well, off this thing? Later on, as one time in 44, Got a near miss and uh, scattered a lot of shrapnel through. I got a piece right by there, so I went down to the sick bay with everybody else. And if you had a tetanus shot through the, their sorting system, you got a purple heart. But if you didn't, you just went back to work. <laughs> Lucky me, I went back to work. <laughs> uh. So that first um, cruise, <laughs> so to speak, uh, yeah. was how many months, sir? Uh, actually, uh, just about a year, from 11th of November 43 to 11th of November 44. That's why we got to think about the Holiday Express there. Most of our actions were on holidays oh, for some reason. Around that time, yeah. Okay. And, so during that period of time, they were all pretty much in the same area, or, or you, yeah. were you moving on? Well, we were. What, what were some of the islands or the battles that uh, you Oh, we went up through the Marshalls and the Gilberts, and the Weetok, and Ulithi, and Truk, and, and we were up into the Philippines in the latter part of the cruise. Uh -huh. Any problems with submarines? No, we were always protected by the destroyers and yeah. company type ships. So you were mentioning, I think later on, that you did take uh, some battle damage. Uh, yeah. Tell, me, tell me about that. Close one. Well, I don't know. It was just an accumulation of close hits. Okay. But no, some no, guys you, had gotten shrapnel, usually what the what main culprit was as far as uh, people, but uh, I was far enough inboard that I didn't catch any of the mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, but the reason for the ship to go into Bremerton for repairs yeah, was, was from? Basically, basically battle damage. Battle damage. Mm -hmm. Being out there for a year, yeah. and getting pot shot at that. But stuff. no direct hits when you no. were in port. No, they got those after I got Well, on. I thought, because so I, I thought that Bunker Hill got, yeah. got hit pretty good. Yeah, it was with the May Kamikazes, 45. Wasn't it? I got off in January of 45. Well, okay, tell me about uh, what happened to it in 45. Well, uh, after I got off, you mean? Mm -hmm. well, that's when they took the big one, the 
uh, Max Kennedy wrote the book about uh, two uh, kamikazes hit one uh, right about the midships and one right to the number three elevator full. And it was a rough mess because uh, uh, this buddy of mine from Plymouth, Massachusetts, he lived through the whole thing and uh, he got from the hangar deck to the flight deck by crawling on the outside of the ship. Some guys in the gun tub threw a line and mm -hmm. hoisted him up and everything. So he said the hangar deck was a mess. Airplanes would melt down, the engines, the whole pile, just a pile of uh, aluminum. Uh, fortunately, I never got into anything that Yeah, Yeah, terrible. there's photographs of that, yeah. I think, and yeah. the ships had a pretty... Uh, yeah. Uh, famous. Yeah. But, uh, I value my two years being aboard the Bunker Hill because I think we saw a pretty good active part of the war from 11th of November of 43 at Raval till up through the Philippines liberation. Mm -hmm. So we were, got in you know, on the Marianas Turkey shoot. That's when we oh. first uh, had some night flying done. We even had a Jap in our uh, landing pattern wanted to get aboard, but they kept waving him off. <laughs> Finally, he ran out of gas and splashed. Yeah, I but, remember uh, hearing about that. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. But uh, yeah. when uh, I guess it was Mitchner had, had ordered the fleet to lights on because they had all these planes coming back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. That's, in fact, I was. I don't know, doing something on the flight deck, even though I was supposed to be on the hangar deck working. The plane thought I was doing on some knick-knack thing. But uh, one of the planes come in and bounced over the barriers and lit on top of a the plane. They had a pretty good fire going, which, of course, I was way up forward and jumped into the catwalks to get out of the way, but uh, scared the fire out of you pretty well. <laughs> service that I gave wartime. Absolutely. By the way, I want to go back a little bit. Did you, uh, did you have any, uh, were you married at the time when no. you were in the service? Did you have anybody special back home? No. Not okay. then, anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so, why did they transfer you off then when they did? Just uh, normal. Just that's what's just. Because uh, they had sent me to F4U school down in Los Alamitas. Well, the first half of the guys went to leave, and uh, it's been about a dozen of us went down, not realizing we had already had Corsair experience. In fact, we knew more about them than the instructors did, but then we didn't tell them that. <laughs> but uh, a bunch of us got together on Christmas Eve of 44 in Hollywood, drank to the old days. But. Uh, To say I enjoyed my time with VF-17 and Bunker Hill yeah. as much as I did anything in the Navy, but I went to a lot of other places, Whidbey Island and then to ADAC. What were you I, doing at those places? Uh, was, well, the uh, biggest thing I did at, in ADAC was learn to become a flight engineer on a PBY. Really? So you went up? But uh, I just came back. To engine school to Whidbey Island. They put me in charge of the engine change shack. But uh, I guess that whatever their rotational schedules were, it didn't matter where you worked or what horsepower you had or anything else, you, yeah. time to go. Yeah. So the draft going to Alaska from Seattle, they put me in charge of it. I asked the master drivers, what the heck did he put me in there? I was junior one of the bunch. I said, oh, I just went down the list and used the first name I could pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> so just that kind of luck was a good portion of what I had, being in the right place at the right time. And where were you when the war ended? Engine school in Chicago. <laughs> That's where I made my first mistake of getting married. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Did you marry someone from back there then? Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe she was a little yeah, I called her a Chicago improved Okie. Oh. <laughs> well, that's not for publication. <laughs> <laughs> Behave yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, okay, so, um, and then you decided to stay in the Navy? Did you? Yeah. I went to ship over for two years. It was like, because the peacetime Navy was a picnic. I had so much good duty, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> and uh, where did you, uh, where was your next duty station then after that? Well, at Corpus Christi, I was at Rod Field Auxiliary Station, Cabinets Field Auxiliary, Navy Recreation Barracks in Port Aransas, Texas, when I was hunting and fishing guide for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that closed, had to go back to the theater at the main station. We had a choice of working in a theater or working in a hobby shop. And I ended up being the store manager of the store at the hobby shop for a year and a half. Had an expense account, fly to Dallas twice a month. All I did call for an airplane down at operations and go down and got acquainted with a first class enlisted pilot. So we made the trip twice a month. So bought the hobby supplies and stuff, but uh, we had expense money, five dollars for a taxi cab that we hitchhiked and got a bottle instead of, but, uh, <laughs> what do you expect from a bunch of sailors? You know? <laughs> so that was your hobby, huh? <laughs> yeah, but uh, actually the last two years that I was in, I did more storekeeping than I did uh, mechanic and because the Laredo guys were the only ones that stayed in, so they're just uh, surplus. But this chief storekeeper that I knew in Woodby Island from when I was in the engine chain shop, he asked me, if was a, you want to be an expediter? And I says, what's that? He said, that's the guy that chases the parts through the system right now without having to wait three days for it to work. I would call him Air OG, AOG, aircraft on ground. This was the priority that I used, and uh, I did that for about the last year that I was in. And when did you get out? I got out in January of 50. I was the first sailor discharged from the Naval Air Station in Corpus Christi. And I ran into a buddy of mine that uh, we had been to Class A Mex school in VF-17 together. He went down when we were to land base because he was a hydraulic specialist. He says, I'd come out and be a weekend warrior. And she says, I was trying to go to school on the GI Bill, $180 a month, and come out, play around at Los Alamitas for a weekend, get an extra $27.20. That made my income over 200 then. It was tall cotton. <laughs> but uh, I didn't know that uh, Four months down the line, I get a telegram saying, come back to active duty. That's when uh, I got the reserve squadron, and like I say, they had FRU-4s with four-bladed props, which is an improvement. And uh, in the process, uh, they had gone with downdraft carburetors because the updraft were fire-prone if you didn't know what you're doing. It was a picnic compared to South Pacific. Oh, uh, yeah, that's for Korea. Yeah. We ended up going to Korea on the Bonham Richard. And uh, I had a first class petty officer's mess so it's separate from the regular enlisted guy because the chiefs already had theirs. And uh, even coming out of Japan one night in the first class mess, we had frog legs, <laughs> which. <laughs> He talked to the GI and he says, well, what dream ship are you on, you know? <laughs> but, uh, so what you had done, you had gone into the reserves, but then come back on active duty as yeah, a reserve. For, yeah, did two years. They needed you for Korea, basically? Yeah, well, uh, this fellow, a buddy of mine, his, his name's Red Edmiston, and he, he and I, in this reserve squadron, had more Corsair experience than anybody. So we just ran it. In fact, we had a chief come in one day and 
he had to check in with me. And the next day he had to check out with me and I said, I don't know how you got what you got, Harlow, but uh, says, I sure wish I had got you transferred out of here, but I, they transferred me instead. <laughs> what, uh, the Bonham Richard, what was its uh, designation? Number uh, CBA 31, it's an Essex class carrier. And uh, did you have any sorties off of Korea? Yeah, we flew uh, off all reserve pilots, but we had the best uh, maintenance record and the flying record of any reserve squadron out there. Hmm. They lose anybody? No. no we were and then usually they would be strafing and stuff like yeah. that, ground support? Yeah, yeah. yeah, ground support was their basic activity. Say it's different to climate change. It was like going on a pleasure cruise, <laughs> but uh, we still. I got a letter at home. It says our squadron had the best maintenance record of any reserve squadron going. So that was signed by our skipper. So I figured if he's a lieutenant commander, he should know. What is writing down here in black and white. So when you went off active duty then, uh, what did you do after two years? Well, I got out of the Navy and went to work at a parts store for a guy that used to work for my dad when he had a parts store and blah, blah, blah. Where was that? In Santa Ana. Uh -huh. I ended up back there. Yeah. Well, I meant to ask you, your, your buddy from high school that you guys went to oh. the Navy together, where did he go and how did well, he, he went on a destroyer as the air conditioning guy. And uh, then he got out after six years and went into the air conditioning business in India. You, you told me that, yeah. yeah. But, uh, air where was the air? Oh, in India. In India, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, you Hands air conditioning yeah. service. Okay. So you're back at the parts department in Santa Ana? Yeah, I worked for him. And I uh, thought I'd make more money working for another guy and give me a tantalizing offer. But I'd already uh, kind of been playing around, thinking of going in business for myself, and uh, I didn't last very long with him as soon as he found out I was going in business for myself. But uh, we started, had a partner and also had worked for my dad in the back in the 20s and the 30s, but uh, he had done all the shop work, repair work, so he'd take care of the machine shop end of it, and I did the parts. We hooked up with NAPA or NAPA. Mm -hmm. We had the first NAPA store in Santa Ana. What street? Where was that? Uh, corner of Fifth and Bush in Santa Ana. Mm -hmm. And we moved out to 1039 West 4th Street in 1959 because we had grown and the bulk of our business came from the west side of town because all the other part stores were east of us mm -hmm. except for one. But uh, well, I did that for accounting the part stores that I worked for, owning half interest in one in Santa Ana and owning one in Yucca Valley. And then afterwards, working for two different car dealerships, I did 23 years in the auto parts business. Mm -hmm. I became an outside salesman and did that for 23 years before I retired. Wow. After 10 years in the Navy. Selling parts or cars or what? Expendable maintenance supplies, nuts and bolts, electrical terminals, spray cans, brass fittings, most anything kind of a threaded faster than you'd want. Yeah. Well, you, you would travel or, or you had your a small territory from Pomona to Kingman, Arizona, and Indio to Bishop. Really? Other than that, I was just take it like easy. <laughs> what, what, what kind of car were you driving around all those? I uh, wore out five pickups in that time. Yes. <laughs> Ford pickups. Yeah. And where did you, where were you living most of, where did your kids grow up? Uh, Yucca Valley. Yucca Valley. Now are you uh, uh, married again by this time or, or what? Yeah. Okay. And your second wife, where did you meet her? What was her name? Uh, Accidental start that clicked pretty good for a while. Her name was June. 
Yeah. And she had four kids. That was the biggest trouble <laughs> raising the kids. But uh, we had one of our own. And what was your, what was your child's name? My yeah, that was Molly, oh. my daughter. And where does she, where does she live now? Yucca Valley. Oh, okay. <laughs> my son got a son and just had a grandson. So I got four generations of Harlows yeah. living in Yucca Valley. In Yucca Valley. What's your son's name? Eric. <laughs> well, what else? <laughs> we call him Russ. His call him Russ. Is Russ. He goes by Russ. Okay, so you have uh, how many grandchildren then? And a great, three one great, three, yeah. four great, yeah. four, four great grandchildren. Okay. I can't uh, keep track of them. They come <laughs> along too fast. And uh, where do you what where do you live in Yucca Valley? Up in the north end of town, almost into the Yucca Mesa area. The, what street do you live on? Buena Vista Drive. Okay. So you've been in Yucca Valley for how many Since years? Since 1963. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, and this, this pretty young lady, in fact, this young lady, why don't you go over and sit next to me? There, if you would. Oh. So, Marjorie, where did you guys meet? We met, I was a waitress in Yucca Valley. Yeah. At a place called Ray's Cafe. Is it still there? No, it's no longer there. Yeah. Uh, and that was in 67. And. I knew his wife and family, and uh, but he used to bring his crew in from his parts house at noon. They'd close down, and he'd bring them in. And I'll hold that uh, thought for a second. I got to change the tapes right now. Okay. Yeah. You want another sip of water there, you guys? Yeah, you can share right if you like. Cooler over here. <laughs> so. So he'd bring his buddies in. Yeah, I'd bring all his crew from his business in, and uh, I'd serve them lunch every, just about five days a week. And what what did they? What was their? What was the bill of fare? What did they usually? Like I for think lunch? they usually all loved the hot beef sandwiches. They really liked those. Uh, and in '72, my husband at that time. Uh, bought a, a service station, a Texaco station. So I worked there and and also waitressing. <laughs> I learned how to put air in tires, check oil, and when we did a lube job, we, we not only vacuumed, but we cleaned the windows inside and out, which you don't find anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and uh, so over well, the years, over Texaco, I remember the old Milton Burrow show. And oh, they yeah. Had a, you know, and they had that, that uh, commercial, and they'd be singing, and the yeah. guys would be out there <laughs> wiping the windows and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. But that was quite a time. And then my husband got very ill, and we had to close it down. Mm. And I continued working in different restaurants in the area. I was a, a dinner house called Callahan's. I was a head waitress there for a year until they sold out, and then I went to work for, well, I worked at several different ones up there. And I retired at the age of 70 after my husband died, and uh, so I had three children, and... What are their names? I had uh, Ted, he's the oldest, he just retired from the school district. Uh, Morongo Valley, or Morongo Basin. Basin School District. And I have a daughter, Linda, and she lives in Palm Desert. And I have my youngest son, Mark, also known as Charlie. He lives in Riverside. Okay, all pretty close by then. Huh? Yeah. And you have grandchildren too? I have one grandson and one great grandson. Oh, okay. 
And where did you grow up? What was, I, your, what was your maiden name? My maiden name was Maynard. My father was a newspaper man, and he took me with him a lot of places. When I was about maybe 10 years old, he used to take me out to the Fullerton Airport. We'd get on the, he, his buddies, at the pilots out there, they'd put me in the old Stearman's and take me for rides. And then I was privileged to ride in a tri-motor Ford that used to carry the mail from Fullerton Airport to the Los Angeles Airport. And I got to ride in the final wow. flight of that wow. with my dad. Yeah. So, and then when Pearl Harbor that day, the Sunday, I'll never forget because dad grabbed me and off we went to the newspaper office and the teletype coming through. And we were there all day long, locked reading that. And in the meantime, right across the street from the newspaper office was the fire department. And we had our car parked over there. Well, when we went to leave, our car had been stolen. <laughs> so that day, we just, we remember that very well. <laughs> and during the war, uh, I did, when I got older, uh, 16, 17, they used to get the girls the USO, and we'd go out to the Air Force Base there in Santa Ana and dance on Friday nights. And uh, I had a brother that went in the Navy. He was, uh, he went to UCLA in, uh, in the ROTC, in ROTC. And he graduated from there and and went on. He, but he didn't see act any service until uh, Korea. So. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I Where did you go to high school? Fullerton High School. Okay. Fullerton Indians. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then how did you? Uh, uh, did you go to college after high school? No, or? I got married and mm -hmm. I. Uh, I had my children, we lived in San Diego, I married a fellow from San Diego, and uh, when in 66 we moved to, set to Yucca Valley because of my husband's health, and uh, like I say, I was a waitress and raised my kids there. <laughs> and so um, then and you've been married for how long now? App and I have been married eight and a half years, and it's been wonderful. Oh, we had both lost our spouses, and and we ran into each other at the tortilla section of Stater Brothers. <laughs> 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 and that started it all, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you have fajitas every anniversary, I guess. Huh? <laughs> uh, one of the first things we discovered about it is her dad was a county clerk in Santa Ana, signed my divorce papers for my first one. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been some kind of an omen, I suppose. And then my mother <laughs> sold him his first house when he moved to Yucca Valley. Really? Oh, well, it was destiny. Divine yeah. intervention. <laughs> and do you, have you done much traveling? What do you like to do? To we did well, in our first few years of marriage, but since then we've taken turns in having medical problems. Oh. and. But did you uh, drive around? Oh yeah, there? we loved to, we loved Arizona down in the southeastern part. Did of you it. have a travel trailer or anything like no. that, or just, just go just around? Just go, and, yeah. We had a, yeah. yeah. We just enjoyed that, and we made a couple of trips up to Montana to see my mother and my sister, and then over to Washington to visit with uh, his son, and uh, and then down the coast. We got to drive quite a bit. Yeah. And what do you do to occupy your time these days? Well, we don't do a lot, but we see a lot of doctors. <laughs> and we volunteer for uh, our hospital, visiting nurses hospice uh -huh. once a week, oh, and, yeah. and we pack the nurses' bags for them. And, and oh, I don't know, it seems like we're busy. Yeah. We don't sit. And your daughter. You have a daughter that's here in Palm Desert, you yes, say? Do you uh -huh. come down to see her very often? In fact, we had lunch with her today. Yeah. Yeah. And what's her name? 
Linda Ames. Okay. What does she do? Yeah. She, nothing. She's a housewife, and well, she writes a lot. She's she does a lot of writing and poetry and things like that. She's very talented that way. And Hep, we were mentioning how. Uh, uh, you were interviewed for the local newspaper here, the Desert Sun, yeah. Denise Goolsby. Uh, did she just call you one day, or how did how did that come about? Uh, I think he called her because he saw in the paper that they were going to do some interviews, uh, and uh, and he was telling her what a nice job she did on something, and when it all worked around and yeah. it ended up, they had a lot of phone visits, so. <laughs> it, have you been to the Air Museum here before, or is this your first time? We've been a couple of times, and he was here before that. Yeah. I've had at least three visits before. Okay. Um, well, I think we're maybe getting ready to pretty well wrap it up. Is there anything either of you would like to, anything else to share that we haven't covered? I can't think of anything, can you dear? No, Greg, got anything you'd like to add? Oh, okay. Any questions? <laughs> this has been great. <laughs> okay. I usually, uh, at this point, I like to, um, you know, we have a lot of young people going into harm's way these days, oh, yeah. like you did years ago. If you had any advice for them, what might it be? You mean like you're the Navy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he advises all of them to join the Navy, okay. stay off Still that land. Thing. Place to sleep and get three squares a day. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I have uh, a lot of feelings about it, but I, yeah. I don't know. That I've seen so many. I had to spend some time in the, in the emergency room at our local hospital, and unfortunately, next to a young Marine that had tried to take his own life. Mm -hmm. And there's so much of that, but people don't hear about that. And these kids have to go over there and what they have to do and see is is, is just beyond me, any comprehension. I, and I feel so deeply for those boys. But with the good Lord, help. We hope we can bring them all home pretty soon. That's right. Yeah. Hap, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thanks thank for you. coming in and sharing with us. Margie, thanks for coming in too. Really enjoyed this.